Sometimes things don't go the way we've planned them, right? Even with the best of intentions, things don't always work out the way that we think they should. Here's an example of this from just last week in my own life. Last Sunday morning, I got up pretty early, as I often do. I got my shower, got ready to head here for church, as, I, as, as is my routine. On my way out the door of my apartment, I grabbed my backpack, I grabbed my phone, I headed out the door, I locked the door, I shut the door, I took a step, and then I had a sinking feeling come over me that I had forgotten something. A step away from my apartment door, I reached in my pockets and realized I was without my keys. Without my keys, meaning I was both locked out of my apartment and I had no way of either getting into or starting my truck. So as one does in this moment, I began to frantically scan through my options. First about how this was going to mess up my morning, but then I began to think about how to fix this situation. I thought, well, I could call someone to come and get me, but that would only get me to church. I'd still be locked out of my apartment. I thought, honestly, at one point, since it was so early in the morning, I could walk to church, but that would, again, only get me to church. I also knew that my apartment did have a lockout policy that you could call them and they would get you in, but I also knew that came with a $100 fee. But, I, but, as I, but as I frustratingly scanned my options, I could really see no other way that I was getting back into 724 Bentley Ridge Boulevard. I had scanned my options and there was really only one option left. Has anyone else ever been there? Maybe with something much more serious and life-changing than simply being locked out of your home, and maybe something with much more negative consequences than a $100 fee and a delay to the start of your day. Talking about here in moments, uh, moments in our lives where there's truly nothing we can do, right? Where it's truly out of our power, where we are truly powerless, where we are truly stuck, where we are truly hopeless on our own. Maybe it was because of a diagnosis. Maybe it was because the numbers on your bills were more than the numbers in your bank account. Maybe it was because of a loss of a loved one. It could be any number of things that we experience, things that lead us to this literal end of our lobes, to the literal end of the line. These moments in life where we have nowhere to go on your own. Moments where you know that nothing of your own strength and nothing of this world is going to be able to get you through whatever it is that is before you. Now we think about this because this is the context, this is the moment, this is the situation that we find King Ezekiah here where Carl just read for us. It's the moment, it's the place where we find our old pals, the nation of Israel, in this moment. Because they have literally nowhere to go. They have nowhere to turn. They have no hope from this world. Yet here, Hezekiah gives us the one hope. He points us to the one thing that we can actually turn to in all things, even the most bleak things, even the most bleak thing that we will face in this life, which is certain death, as Hezekiah faces right now. Hezekiah shows us here that there is always, always a place that we can, in fact, turn. Here in 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 14 through 19, King Hezekiah both shows us and lives out that place. And then God shows us what he can do, even in the darkest, most bleak, most seemingly grim, hopeless situations in life. If we use this gift that is prayer that God has given to us. If you're not already, please turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 19, but before we focus there, we must understand the context of this moment. So we'll begin by looking at 2, uh, 2 Kings chapter 18 uh, from sort of an aerial view. King Hezekiah, we must know who he is. King Hezekiah is a good guy, and he's a great king by Israel's standards. 2 King chapter 18, starting in verse 3, it gives us that rare, positive description of a king of Israel said of Hezekiah. It says, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Examples of this is Hezekiah, he removed the high places. He smashed the sacred stones and he cut down the Asherah poles. He even broke into pieces that bronze snake that Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. Hezekiah, he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. For there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or that came after him. Hezekiah held fast to the Lord, and he did not stop from following him. He kept the commands of the Lord that the Lord had given to Moses. And the Lord was with him. Hezekiah was successful in whatever he undertook. Hezekiah rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. From the watchtower to the fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. Now, as we know, Judah had some good kings, 
But Judah, as we also know, had some really evil and terrible kings. We can think back to our series that focused on the life of the prophet Elijah for several examples of bad kings that Israel and Judah had, Omri, Ahab, and Isaiah, for example. But today we must understand that we are looking at a good king, one of the best that Israel ever had, one who trusted in the Lord and followed his commands. And he trusted in the Lord and followed the commands of the Lord better than anyone before him or after him, our historian who writes Second Kings says. And Hezekiah, he was successful because of that. But what specifically did that look like? Well, Hezekiah's father, the king that followed Hezekiah, or I'm sorry, that preceded Hezekiah, and actually Hezekiah begins his reign as king as a co-regent with, King Ahaz, he was not a good king. He was more like Omri and Ahab than Hezekiah. He was not a king who followed the wills and the ways of the Lord. So Hezekiah, he had a bit of a mess to clean up, both politically and, of course, most importantly, spiritually, as he begins his reign. And clean up Hezekiah did. Hezekiah, we read here, he removed the high places. He smashed the sacred stones and he cut down the Asherah poles. He even broke into pieces that bronze snake that Moses had originally made in the desert. We can think about Numbers chapter 21 for that story. Because apparently that snake had become an idol to Israel because they were literally, as we read here, burning incense to it. What we need to see and remember, and what our historian that wrote the book of 2 Kings is pointing out for us, is there were no king like Hezekiah, either before him or after him. As he's pointing out that not even the good kings of Judah and Israel, they not, not even they had enough gold to remove the high places, for example. Even the kings that we read that served the Lord and did what was right in the, in the eyes of the Lord, usually that note that followed that description of them followed this note. But he did not remove the high places. Not Hezekiah, though. He tore them down. We even see Hezekiah go as far as to take something that was originally used for good in that gold snake, something crafted by Moses himself. Yet because Israel, in their sin, they had turned this man-made, this lifeless thing into something that they were holding in higher esteem than God, because they had turned this lifeless image into an idol, Hezekiah even says that this needs to go. And go it did. So this is a picture of a man who served the Lord above all else, and it gives us the picture of what that actually looked like in his life and how it should look in our life as well. Hezekiah cleaned up Israel spiritually, but how did he clean it up politically? Well, he attempted to do that, but that was a little bit harder. There was a little bit more opposition to that, as we will see this morning. At this time in history, the ones in the world that had the biggest sticks were Egypt and there was Assyria. At this point in time, King Hezekiah and Judah, they are under the finger of that big stick of Assyria and its ruthless king, Sennacherib. We read here, starting in verse 19 of chapter 18, that Hezekiah, in an attempt to get away from Assyria, he had actually made a treaty with Pharaoh in Egypt, which to King Sennacherib, this, this allegiance, this a treaty with Egypt, it was taken as an act of rebellion, it was taken as an act of war. And now King Sennacherib and Assyria are coming to seek restitution. Hezekiah, we see here, he pays Sennacherib in Assyria 300 talents of gold and 30 talents, I'm sorry, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. But even that high price was not enough. Sennacherib, here he comes and he comes calling and he comes taunting. First in 2 Kings 18, he's taunting that alliance with Egypt and then he concludes by taunting Hezekiah and most importantly, Israel's God. And he does this, we must see for all to see and hear. Sennacherib sends his messengers to Hezekiah's men. This men and this encounter takes place in the very public walls of Jerusalem. So Hezekiah's messengers, Hezekiah's men, they request that a Sennacherib's messenger speak to them in Aramaic so the, the Hebrew-speaking Jews will not be able to understand and thus not fall into fear. But they did not oblige. Sennacherib's men says for all to hear. He says, hear the great word of the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he cannot deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says that the Lord will surely deliver us. The city will not be given into the hand of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. 
Then each of you will eat fruit in your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern. Until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey. He says simply choose life and not death. Do not listen to Hezekiah for he is misleading you when he says the Lord will deliver you. Has the God of any other nation delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Seraphim, Hena and Iva? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But the people remained silent. They said nothing in reply because the king had commanded them to not answer him. Then Elikim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told them what the, Lord, what the field commander had said. Hezekiah and Israel, they are up against it. We must understand that in this moment, Jerusalem is surrounded by a massive army. Jerusalem is cut off. Prior to this moment, Assyria has laid waste to all that stood in their way, and they're letting Jerusalem know that. They've laid waste to anyone who tried to stood in their way, and now they've made their way to Hezekiah and Israel and its capital city of Jerusalem, and they have that city shut up. They have the people of Israel closed in. They have it penned in like a caged bird. We read this not only in the word of God, but we also read this in Sennacherib's own annals, his own history log that have survived the test of time. Hezek or Sennacherib writes of Hezekiah that he had him penned in like a caged bird. There was nowhere for Hezekiah to go and there was nowhere for Hezekiah and Israel to turn. He was stuck. He was out of options. He was in trouble. And it's in these moments that we determine who we really are. It's in these moments that we determine what we are really seeking. It's in these moments that we show who we are really trusting in and following. And in light of our eternity sermon series and what we spoke about last week and what we will see throughout our series, how our belief about our eternity has an effect on our today. What I want us to see today is that life is hard, that life is challenging. This life is far from without challenges, even challenges that seem like there's no way to overcome. And these challenges come whether we are following and trusting in the Lord as proved here in the life of one of Judah's greatest king. As those living in a fallen world, we will face troubles until that great day when Jesus calls us home and we get to spend our rest of our days in his eternally good and free from suffering presence. Until that day that we look forward to and he asks to come, we will face troubles. We will have a moment or likely moments in our life where we, like Hezekiah, are left seemingly with nowhere to turn. But what I want us to see today is there is always somewhere to turn. What I want us to see today is that as we await the day when we will see the full glory of God without the filter of this sin-filled world, we even today, even in this moment, always have a direct access line to that full glory of God and the power of God, which is prayer. Today we see how to call on God's glory in this life and how to bring God's will being done here on earth just as it is in heaven. 2 Kings 19, 9, 14 through 19 is one of the most beautiful, it's one of the most faith-filled, it's one of the most inspiring prayers in all the Bible. It's short, it's concise, but there's much to it. And in it we see four C's of confidence that we have available to us in prayer. Four steps, four things, four principles that our prayers should reflect if we desire our prayers to be both powerful and effective, as we see here in Hezekiah's life and as we read written about by the uh, brother of our Lord James in James 5.16. The first thing that we need to do and to live out and to pray out is we need to concede our own weakness. Sennacherib has sent his messengers to the very public walls of Jerusalem. He's made his threats. He's uttered his taunts against Hezekiah, Israel, and their God. And now he rubs salt into that open room. Now he puts seemingly the nail in Israel's coffin. Sennacherib, after that initial report that we just looked at, that initial encounter with Israel, Sennacherib now receives a report from home. There's an enemy king, the king of Cush, that is marching out to fight against him in Assyria. And so Sennacherib is now very much motivated to end this conflict with Israel and Jerusalem, and he's very much motivated to get home. So what he does is he sends another letter, another message to Hezekiah, a letter that says much of the same of what we just read. 
It says, says, say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God that you depend on deceive you when he says that Jerusalem will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Surely you have heard what the king of Assyria has already done to countries, destroying them completely. And you think you will be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my predecessors deliver them? The gods of Gaza and Haran, Respa, and the people of Eden who were in Telazar. Where is the king of Hamath or the king of Arpad? Where are the kings of Lair, Seraphim, Hena, and Iva? Leading into this moment, Hezekiah has done the right thing from that first message from Sennacherib. He's taken the previous threats and taunts, and he has turned the burden over to a wise and godly counselor, the wise and godly counselor that we know of as the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah gives Hezekiah some good news. Isaiah speaks for the Lord in saying that, that Hezekiah and Israel, they should not be afraid. Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with the underlings of the king of Syria that they have blasphemed the Lord with. Listen, when Sennacherib hears a certain report, God will make him want to return to his own country. And there God will have him cut down. That's the word of the Lord given to Hezekiah. That's certainly good news. God says through Isaiah, hey, Hezekiah, man, don't worry. I've got this. Sennacherib, he's about to hear a report that's going to make him want to go home. And there I'm going to have him cut down. That's really good news. The problem is, though, for this, for Hezekiah, is that in this moment, Sennacherib has received a report from home. And it's a report from home that's making him want to return home. However, before Sennacherib does that, he decides that he's still going to cut down Jerusalem and Hezekiah. Sennacherib comes to Hezekiah with a full out taunt and rebuke that says, don't think for a second that you are getting out of this alive. Don't think for a second that this report is going to save you. Sennacherib says, oh, your God says that he's going to deliver you? Well, how did that work out for the gods of all these other countries? Where were their gods when I attacked them? How good and how valuable were their protections against my army? Hezekiah has done the right things. He's followed the Lord and he has used his life to help others follow the Lord. He's faced adversity and he's turned to godly counselors and the very word of God. Yet here he is between a rock and a hard place, between a snack rib and an army, it just doesn't seem like God has got this, right? It just doesn't seem like God is going to be able to answer and fulfill that promise he's made through Isaiah. Hear that, that, that uh, proof that maybe God isn't going to fulfill this promise? It comes in this letter and all of its horrible news. Hezekiah receives it, he reads it, and you can imagine him reading it with the deepest of pits in his stomachs. And so he goes into the corner and he just pouts, right? No, rather, he takes that letter and all of its fear-inducing, nausea-causing words. He enters into the temple of the Lord. He enters into the presence of God and he lays it out before God and he prays this prayer. He says, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone have got our God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone have made both the heaven and the earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacheribs have sent to ridicule you, the living God. He admits that it is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone, fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hands so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. First in this prayer, first in this moment of torment, this moment of deep grief and pain and fear, Hezekiah concedes his own weakness. And he says, God, I cannot win this battle. He says, it is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings, they have laid waste to all that have come before them. They have thrown even their gods into the fire and destroyed them. In other words, Lord, Hezekiah says, Lord, if it is true, Lord, it is true. What Hezekiah says, it is true. He's not lying. I, like the other nations that has come up against them, are penned in like a caged bird. We have nowhere to turn. We, like the other nations and their lowercase g gods, are about to be thrown into the fire and about to be destroyed. Hezekiah is very real and very clear about his own weakness. In our own lives, in our own walks with Christ, is that there is this is where our walks with Christ and our lives with Christ begin it's where they need to begin 
Because we cannot surrender our lives to Christ. We cannot truly follow him. We cannot truly submit and commit to Christ without first confessing our own weakness. Without first confessing our own insufficiency. Without first confessing our own sin. We cannot follow Christ without saying, God, I am a person of unclean lips and I come from a people of unclean lips. We cannot truly follow God without saying before God, God, I am a sinner and I have fallen well short of you and your glory. God, I know that on my own I have no share in your goodness and I have no presence in your kingdom. We must confess our weakness to God. All while knowing on our way that we have no, or on our own, we have no way to stand before God, but also confessing that God has not left us on our own. We must first confess our own weakness in prayer and in our coming to God, but then we must confess the greatness of our God. Hezekiah recounts the plight that he is up against, the plight, the fear, the problem that he is up against, which is death and destruction. He recounts how all those other nations, their kings and their gods, have failed and fallen before Assyria. But then he follows it up with this. He says, but they were only gods made of wood and stone. They were only fashioned by human hands. But now, Lord, deliver us from his hand so that all those kingdoms and all the earth will know that you alone, Lord, are God. Hezekiah says, Lord, this is what has happened to these other gods. This is what has happened to these other nations. This is what has happened to these other kings, Lord. But you are not like those other gods. And Hezekiah says, because you are our God, we are not like those other nations. And we are not like those other kingdoms. Hezekiah says those gods were not really gods at all, but they were just merely pieces of wood and stone fashioned by human hands, but you, God, are the living God. Hezekiah professes that all those things, all these things that we can turn to in this life, that all those things in which our hands or other human hands can make, that none of those things has the power to even hear our prayers, much less answer and save us. Hezekiah confesses that he is calling on one greater than himself, that he's calling on one greater than he that is found in the world and that his confidence is resting in him alone. That is where he is turning to for his salvation. And brothers and sisters, the same needs to be true of us because there are many things in this world in which we can turn to in every moment of our life, whether the moments in our lives are good or bad. We can turn to armies and politicians. We can turn to money and wealth. We can turn to power and prestige. We can turn to our own hands or the hands of others. Yet there is only one who always answers. There's only only one who always hears. And there's only one who never fails. His name is Jesus Christ. So as we go through this life, are we turning to him and are we turning to him alone? In our turning, are we professing our own weakness before him while proclaiming the greatness of our God and Savior? And as we concede and as we confess the greatness of God, are we coming clean about our problem, whatever it may be? The most honest and to-the-point prayer that we as followers of this great God can pray is simply, God, help me. Hezekiah at this moment has a big and enormous mountain that is before him, a mountain that he is incapable on his own of ever climbing. What Hezekiah does, though, in this moment that we need to emulate is he does not try to climb it alone. This is one of my favorite images in all the Bible that we have as faithful followers of Christ that we very easily can follow and live out in our lives. Hezekiah is given the worst news that someone could be given. He's given the news that he and his family, the nation that he is king over, the entire line of David and lineage of David that he's entrusted in to protect, all of that is in jeopardy of being destroyed, cut off from the earth. He gets it all in this literal literal letter from a man that can make it a reality. And what does Hezekiah do? He takes that letter. He takes the letter and all the bad news that it contains, and he simply lays it before the Lord. He says, Lord, here it is. He spreads it out before the Lord and trusts the Lord to answer. What a picture of both the literal and symbolic act of turning our problems, struggles, griefs, and sins over to the Lord. And then what a powerful response from our God. But before we look at that, we need to ask ourselves, how often do we keep our letters to ourselves? How often do we attempt to hold our problems, burdens, griefs hostage from others. 
How often do we, even before the all-knowing, the all-seeing God, try to withhold our problems from him? Hezekiah, both in his prayer and earlier when he turned to Isaiah for godly counsel, he gives us a picture of what it looks like to live in light of heaven today. What our life and our view of eternity, the effect that it should have on our lives today. Because whether we're men or women, whether we're young or old, whether we're rich or poor, whether we're powerful or powerless, we are all meant to live in community. We are all meant to live and, and be an active and living part of this body of Christ, this church, this gathering of people that Christ has made us a part of. And being a living, living and active part of that body is, is not only about serving, although it certainly is, but it's also about sharing. Sharing struggles as we share our lives. Sharing victories as well. Mike gave us the picture Easter Sunday morning of the comfort and strength that he was able to draw upon from the prayers and support that he received while he was hospitalized. We have countless examples now of men and women who've been thankful and been blessed by Edie's card ministries and the Pequay prayer warriors. As you sit here yourself, as those that have been in church for, for a long, some time, you can likely think of one or probably numerous times that you yourself have been comforted and encouraged by this beautiful gift that God has given us, which is his church. Yet even with all this in mind, we more often than not try to push through things by ourselves. Do we not try to get by by our own and through our own strength? Well, God has not designed it to be that way. It's not supposed to be this way. God designed us to live in community. God is a God himself who lives in community and in relationship. God is a God who lives in relationship both with us and desires that relationship with us, but he's a God as the three-in-one God who lives in relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One of the coolest, most thought-provoking verses in all the Bible is Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. All three members of the Trinity are present and active in creation, and all three members of the Trinity, as Hezekiah puts it here, are enthroned between the cherubim. We are made in God's image, and a part of that image bearing is we are meant to live in community with God and with others. And a big part of that is we share our struggles, we share our burdens, we share our sins even openly. James, before saying that the prayers of a righteous person are both powerful and effective, he says this. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you all may be healed. A huge facet of prayer is prayer prayed in community. It's prayer prayed within the body. is the confession of our sins and our weaknesses and allowing that body to pray for us. The prayer of community. And then there's one more C that we need to see in view of prayer. In all our prayers, whether individually or on our own, we must clamor for the glory of God. This must be the thing that is the focus, the main idea, the big point of our prayers. In this moment, Hezekiah comes before God. He lays that letter out before God. He spells out his weakness. He confidently declares that there is no God like the God he is praying to. He lays out all that is troubling him before God, but he doesn't make this request. He doesn't say these things in his own name. Rather, he makes it in the name and for the glory of God. Verse number 19 is the most important verse and one of the most telling verses in all the Bible when it comes to prayer. He says, now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand. Why? So that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are Lord and God. This is a total reversal of Sennacherib and earthly kings. Sennacherib thinks he is the God on the scene, right? He thinks he's the one that cannot be defeated or thwarted. He thinks everything, including the defeat of Yahweh and his people, it is done to his glory. As king, Sennacherib is seeking to build his kingdom and no one else's. But this is not true of Hezekiah and it's not true of followers of Christ. For his eyes and our eyes are always on another. Our eyes are always on another's glory, on another's power, on another's kingdom. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kings of the earth may know that you alone are God and Lord. Hezekiah prays with God and the things of his kingdom primarily in mind. This is the same reason that Jesus instructs us to begin our prayers with some version of our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. 
Your will be done here on earth just as it already is in heaven. Do a fun thing this week if you have a few spare moments and some internet access. Go to Google and type in line painting fails. Things like this will come up. Things like that will, I'm sure will give you a bit of a chuckle as you read them and focus on the insufficiencies of these jobs of line painting. But line painting on the surface, it couldn't be more simple, right? I mean, you make sure you're a fool of paint, you keep your eyes focused on the line, you keep your eyes focused straight ahead of you, and what could possibly go wrong, right? How could you fail? Yet we see here just the littlest of things can get this off track. Just the littlest of things fouls up this very simple process. Isn't that the same true of prayer in our walks with Christ? Prayer on the surface cannot be simpler. We have a God, an all-powerful God, who desires a relationship with us and who has made the way for a relationship with us. It is all out of our hands other than trusting in Christ. We have a God who wants to commune, wants to talk with us. He wants us to share our highs and he wants us to share our, lo our lows. God is with us on the mountaintops just as he is in the deepest, darkest valleys. It isn't there so much that can soil this good and simple gift. And they're all wrapped up in hardships, things not going the way that we want, they're wrapped up in our own sin and pride, our own selfish desires. Yet God in his promise and his providence, God in his knowledge of who we are as a fallen creation, God in his graciousness, he's given to us this catch-all phrase, this beginning of our prayers that can always center us on him. This phrase of hallowed be his name. Brothers and sisters, prayer is not our one-stop shop to have all the things that we've ever wanted given to us. But what prayer is, it's a place that we can pray for all the things that we will ever need. It's a place that we can call on both for our now and for our eternities. It's the way that we can call on the way life was always designed to be. It's the way that God has called us and designed us to live our lives. Living our lives under the principles of his kingdom coming. Desiring his will to be done here on our earth and in our lives just as it already is in heaven. It's the prayer of God, your kingdom not mine. God, your will, not mine, be done in this moment just as it is in heaven. This is the reality that centers all of our prayers and it's what our prayers should be focused upon. Lisa Turquoise, if I say that right, says this about prayers. She says the, the reality is my prayers don't change God, but I am convinced prayer changes me. Praying boldly boots me out of that stale place of religious habit into authentic connection with God himself. We pray not to change God, but we pray to change ourselves. We pray to become more like God. We pray for our world, our lives, our churches, our families to become more like God. Prayer doesn't change God, but we see it here. It changes us. Prayer doesn't change God, but we see it here, God has already decided that he's already going to answer Hezekiah's prayer. He's already decided that he's going to take down Sennacherib and he's going to liberate Israel. This prayer was not for God as much as it was for Hezekiah. And the same is true of our prayers as well. This prayer was for Hezekiah to be able to come into the presence of God, all while asking him to declare to the world that God alone is God. And while Hezekiah does this, what is it doing? It's reminding Hezekiah that God is God and that he is God alone. God's reputation was on the line here. It was on the line in Sennacherib's schemes. It was on the line in his taunts. taunts. But God didn't need Hezekiah to remind him or inform him of that. God already knew that. The reminder that we see here in this prayer was for Hezekiah. It was the invitation, the opportunity to be still in this moment of trial and know that God was God. Know that God was fully and completely in control. That God's promise was going to come to fruition no matter what Sennacherib or anyone else said. This is prayer. It's a reminder of God's goodness that his promises will never fail. It's a reminder that he will never fail us. 
This is a short, simple, to-the-point prayer. It's a plea for God to remind the world that he alone is God. This same short prayer, it's recorded for us again in Isaiah chapter 37. It was short, concise, and to the point, but look and listen to the results. After having this prayer for conversation with God, Hezekiah and all Israel and all Judah, they will lay their heads down to sleep on this night. Did they do so in complete confidence and peace? I mean, we cannot know that, but I'm sure they certainly had some butterflies in their stomach. Yet on this night, as they lay their heads down to sleep, they will wake to the answer to their prayers. They will wake to the fulfillment of God's promises, and most importantly of all, they will wake to the realization of the glory of God. Jump over to verse 35 of chapter 19. There, the word of God says that that night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, he broke camp and he withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and he stayed there. And there, if you skip ahead, you know that Sennacherib's own son will eventually cut him down in the temple of his God. In one night, God takes down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. To put that in perspective, there were only 160,000 soldiers at the entire battle of Gettysburg. There were only 160,000 there fighting that entire battle. That certainly puts into perspective what Hezekiah and Israel were facing in this moment. Yet on this night, with no soldiers putting a foot to the ground, with no soldier having to draw a sword and no command being given by an earthly king, God has won the battle. God has delivered on his promise. God has not only won the battle, but he has completely ended the war in one and as mentioned, this sermon is a part of our eternity series, which is all about answering our questions about heaven. And the ultimate question that we are seeking today to answer is how do we reach heaven today? Well, heaven is available to each and every one of us, but it's only available through one name. It's only available through one way. It's only available by the name and way of Jesus Christ. For he is the God who has won the battle without ever drawing a sword. He's the king whose kingdom has defeated every foe, even death and sin themselves. For he alone is the Lord of everlasting life, and he is the one who holds the keys to the grave. Jesus Christ has not done this through his striving for military victory, but he's actually done this through his dying. And so today I want you to ask you to examine your life, to examine your mind and thoughts while asking yourself the question, do you know that you are going to heaven? Do you know today that if you die, that if today is your last breath, you know that your sins are forgiven, that you have new life, that you will spend the rest of your days in this presence of Christ? If not, the word of God shows us the way that you can. That way is by putting your faith in the fact that in Jesus Christ, God has taken on our flesh, that he was born of a virgin, that he was conceived by the Spirit of God, that he lived for 30 years walking through life and all that life has to offer, every weakness, trial, and temptation that we still face all these years later. That he lived that life and all that life has for us, even experiencing death itself. Yet through it all, he did not sin. It is by putting our faith and believing in the fact that Christ took that perfect life, that perfect body, and he willingly laid it down on a cross. That in that sacrifice, he took on the entire weight of all of your sin and all of your evil is by trusting in the fact that when Christ uttered from the cross, it is finished, that it that was finished was sin, evil, and death. It is by your faith that Jesus was God's perfect atoning land and that God raised him to the, from the dead three days later. It is by your faith in the fact and the truth that by the same power that God used to raise God, Christ from the dead, is the same power that he raises you as well. It is by that same power by which you are saved. For the good news of Jesus Christ is that God did not send his son into the world to contend the world, but through his son, he has sent his son to the world to save the world. This morning, do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that through your prayer offered in faith and ultimately through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, do you know where you will spend your eternity? If you do not, I asked you, why not today? Jesus is waiting. He has laid down his life to be in communion and relationship with you. 
to give you the assurance of salvation that comes only through his name. Do you have that assurance? For those of you that can say a resounding yes to that question, that I asked you, who are you turning to as you await your heavenly home? This life, has been, as has been mentioned, it is hard. Whether we follow Christ or not, sufferings and trials will come our way. We may never be surrounded by an enemy army, but our ultimate war, we read, is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the powers of darkness and evil. And so I asked you, with what are you fighting that battle with? Are you fighting with, with it with physical weapons, or are you turning to utilizing the greatest weapon that we've ever been given? The weapon that has never been defeated, which is prayer. It is the prayer of those made righteous in Christ. It is the prayer of faith offered in the name of Christ that has power to win these battles. It's clearly exemplified here in the life of Hezekiah. So I ask you first today, do you pray? Do you pray first in all things like Hezekiah does here? But when you pray, do you pray for the glory of God and his kingdom? Prayer is a simple it is a true and it is a powerful gift that we've been freely given by God for our benefit and for the glory of his kingdom. So I invite us to use that gift, Lord, to use that gift for all that it's worth and for all the power that it gives us. Prayer is a wonderful gift and a wonderful blessing. It's a gift that's been given to us by Christ. And so we say to him be the glory both now and forevermore as we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, your will, not ours. Your kingdom, not ours, Lord. Today, we ask that you would help us to put you before all things. Anything, even good things in this world, Lord, we want to trust in you deeper than when we walked in these doors. Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, through the conviction of your word, Lord, make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to exemplify him in all that we say and all that we do. Help us to bring honor and glory to him in the, on the mountaintops. Help us to show the world in those moments that we are on the mountaintop because of Christ. That we are there because of the glory, honor, and power that he has bestowed upon this world. That he has raised us to life and he's raised us to those mountain points. But Lord, also, when we're in the valleys, when things are not going the way that we want, when we're locked out of our apartments or much more serious things, Lord, allow us, convict us, Encourage us, empower us to point people to you, even in these moments. Even in these moments, Lord, help us to seek your kingdom above all else, Lord. Help us to seek your great name and, and your glory. Lord, we want to see your glory spread here at Peckway Church. We want to see it spread down through Whitehorse and over to Gap and through Lancaster County and Pennsylvania, through our nation, Lord, down to Washington, D.C., Lord. We want to see your glory spread uh, through North America and then to the ends of the earth, Lord. We ask for it. We seek it. We desire it. We know that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess you as Savior, or you as Lord, I should say. But Lord, as there's still time, Lord, we desire this world to confess you first as Savior. So that confession, so on that day, that, that confession of Lord will not be a sentence of judgment, Lord. And it will not come with the destination of hell, Lord. We want to see people with us, standing before the throne, confessing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Lord, we look forward to that day in heaven, Lord. But until that day, help us to use every moment, every opportunity that we have had to point people to the saving knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that we have discovered it, Lord. And we ask that you would make that knowledge spread to the ends of the earth for your glory and for your kingdom. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. At this time, as uh, Andrew and Mary Jane come and lead us in our final set to the best songs of worship that we have, first hymn number one, How Great Thou Art, and then hymn number 35, To God Be the Glory.